Hello there. Um, can you see me? Let's see if you can see me. Let's see if this is working. Haha, <laughs> brilliant. Um, oh, Louis. Um, I can tell this is going to be a good one. <laughs> I don't know. I just realised, honestly, about t two minutes ago, I went downstairs to get a coffee and I was like, this might be the worst time ever to do a kind of like, ask me anything, um, which I never do. I never do these. And they go like, oh, the one time I decide to do it is probably a lot of very contentious things going on <laughs> um, that I sometimes try to kind of wade into in a deeper philosophical level. So we'll see, we'll see what the questions are like. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be interesting. So I said this is a bit of an experiment. Hello, by the way, I'm st straight into it. Um, yeah, we got like 23 watching now. Um, I think that'll increase over the next few minutes. So I'll just um, wait for people to arrive. Hello, hello, hey Liz. Hey, Thorne on my side. Nicole, Ruby, oh yeah, lots of people. This is great, fantastic. Um, yeah, um, it's kind of fun. Maybe this will be a fun thing and I'll want to do it more often. Um, we'll, we'll see. I, I have wanted to do more live YouTube stuff. That's definitely the case. Um, and I think that it would be, I even had this idea of doing kind of like a post-fundamentalist debrief. That after Elliot and I do a fundamentalist, maybe the next day, I would um, do a live event or a recorded one where I talk a little bit more in depth about the themes because Elliot and I talk informally over a drink and then sometimes I think, oh, it'd be really interesting to kind of take some of the, the conversations up and reflect on them. So maybe that's something I could do, I'm not sure. We had a really good conversation yesterday um, that was interesting because kind of Elliot and I got into a little bit of kind of uh, some conversation about some cultural issues and uh, you know Elliot and I have a lot in common but we also have a few differences there so we're kind of teasing that out I might talk about that a little bit more in this session not sure um, but uh, I'm definitely going to do a talk next month about it uh, I might talk about that now for a second so basically the idea is I'm going to um, first of all close my computer down a little bit so I don't see myself there we go I'm going to uh, make the next two Paro seminars, maybe even three, public. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know, what I do is every month there is, uh, I think it's the, the first Sunday of every month I give a talk like this and then there's Q&A. Uh, and then the next week there is a kind of hangout time on Zoom for people. And then the week after that, I do a hangout called Coffee and Concepts where I take one of the concepts from the seminar and we chat about it and dissect it. And then the next week, there's another just hangout and conversation. So every week, there is something live happening uh, on the Patreon. In addition to that, there's lots of other things, book studies, other hangout groups. Uh, there's a film society uh, where people watch a movie and then discuss the themes of the movie, which is very good, called Exposure. Um, so there's plenty of things that are happening. Um, on the Patreon and I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to all of you who support me on that. That is a, a lifeline that allows me to continue to do what I do. I mean the truth is I would do this anyway, it doesn't matter. I've always done it since I was 17, I will always do it but you guys help me be able to pay my bills and put money into this stuff and I really appreciate it so thank you especially in these horrible financial times that we, I think we've all been expecting. I've definitely been predicting and expecting this for the last five years or so. And I feel now we're kind of in it and it's very, very difficult for people now. Your money's worth less. Um, it's harder and harder for many of us to, to put food on the table, to pay bills, to do all of that. Um, and so uh, your support is deeply appreciated. And also, if you can't afford a support, what I try to do is put out loads of free material. So there's hundreds of hours of free stuff out there um, that you can hopefully enjoy or not. Um, but thank you to kind of my Patreon family. Really appreciate it. Uh, another thing I wanted to tell you about before we kick off is a Spark Retreat, which I'm doing in October uh, in a place called Crawfordsburn, uh, which I've 
said many times who you know but is the inspiration for Narnia so C.S. Lewis spent a lot of time there so you're literally in Narnia um, uh, that's all sold out um, it's going to be really fun time but I do have access to a cottage very close to the hotel so I am looking for anybody who wants to get a group of friends together or their community together up from three to six people who would like to participate if you're interested email me and I can kind of give you details about that or email me if you want on the, the waiting list in case a room becomes available um, that often happens so let me know just email me uh, so there you go uh, okay now what I'm gonna do <coughs> is <clears throat> I'm going to keep an eye on my computer this is where the questions are going to be if you're watching live basically in the chat box that's the place to ask your question unfortunately it's 180 characters or less but don't let that stop you you just might have to make your question in the two parts if it's a longer one but I think it's 180 characters a bit annoying um, and yeah Tim knows the score here it's even easier for me to see a question if you write question in capitals or Q if you want to see if you're just very few characters. And then, but, I'll, but I'll keep a clue sign because sometimes people are just chatting and then I'm kind of looking for the questions. So if you want to make sure your question is seen, I may still avoid your question and pretend I didn't see it if it's a difficult one, but I will try not to do that. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so yeah, so what I'm doing is uh, this one's going to be open so is next month, maybe the month after. Uh, and um, I wanted to do a bit of a kind of Q&A, just an opportunity to informally, I have got a coffee, sit down, see what questions are on your mind. This might also inform me about what I can talk about in future months. So this is very, very helpful for me to see what, what you're wrestling with, um, what you'd like me to talk about. Uh, next month, I think I want to do a talk on the God of the demand to enjoy. So something that Elliot and I were talking about uh, just yesterday at the sofa there, um, which as I say will come out next week, was basically I was I was arguing here, you know, it was very condensed, so I'm gonna give it a little bit more space and next month I'm gonna give it a lot of space. But I was talking about how um, there is a certain sacrifice that is made when we come into life. life. Actually, Actually, a way, a way, way to describe this is, is that I, I, I used to ask the question, is life possible before, before you die? die. So, so, you know, you know that it's, it's obviously a play, a play on the idea, idea is, there, is there is life, life after, after death? death? And then and there's, there's this other, other question, question uh, which, uh, which other, other people, people have postulated, postulated which is, is forget about is there life after death? Is life possible before you die? Um, um, and the very, the very first, first week, week that I did, did the week Festival, festival uh, uh, that, that was the was question. question. But this, but this year, year the question, the question was, was well, actually, you know what, 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 is there is life there after death? death? I think that's actually a really interesting question. There's a deep way to ask it. And, and what, what I wanted, wanted to argue was, it was, is life after death? death. Um, um, and we and are the proof that there is some sort of death that we have to go through in order to enter into life. There is what is called frustration in psychoanalysis, right? A fundamental loss, that kind of heavy payment, that we, that we give, give to take the boat, the boat across, across into life, into subjectivity. Uh, and, and so, in a way, we are marked forever with this sense of a fundamental loss, a fundamental death that, that we carry with us. So at a superficial level, is there life after death can mean, is there life after the death of people we love? Is there life after the death of a relationship that meant so much to us? Is there life after the, the loss of something incredibly significant, some meaning in our lives, right? And that's a very genuine and deep question that we all have to ask at times in our lives uh, and attempt to answer. But even more fundamentally, just being human means that there was some sort of loss or death. Uh, in, in anthropology, it's called the incest taboo. The incest taboo is where you find it in every civilization. You can't have a civilization without the incest taboo. The incest taboo is very simply the idea that you cannot have private pleasure staying at your mother's breast. 
just kind of privately enjoying sleeping and eating. You actually have to separate and go into the world and find substitute enjoyment and find some sort of substitute pleasure. And that's fundamental to civilization. If we were all caught up in this primordial kind of relationship, then civilization wouldn't exist. In, in a way, discontent and castration is the payment that we pay all of us to some extent uh, to enter into existence. Now, um, that was the background of some of the conversation I was having with Elliot. And the argument I was trying to make with him is that there was a time, and I take this from Todd McGowan's book, The End of Dissatisfaction, where you have societies around what can be called um, the God of Prohibition. And this is the idea that you have a society in which basically everybody realizes that they're that they've sacrificed something, that life is difficult, that life has suffering. We all experience that. But we have some sort of idea of someone who isn't castrated, someone who has not had to go through the incest to be. Uh, and this, classically speaking, is God. God is the one who lacks the lack, is whole and complete, who doesn't have to sacrifice enjoyment. Um, but it could also be some lord or lady or something like that. But the idea is that all of us, basically in the society that we're in, have had to experience a type of sacrifice. And we are unified by that. We're not unified by what we share in common. We're not unified by a shared language, by a shared gender, or by a shared kind of set of practices. We're unified by a shared loss, a lost object. We're unified by all having had the cut that, that, that has brought us into life. Now, what McGowan argues, and I think very persuasively, is that we live today not with the God of prohibition, but the God of the demand to enjoy. Uh, this is called the super egoic uh, demand to enjoy. Right? which means that we feel this sense in which we're surrounded by people who have had, no, had to not give up their enjoyment, who are not castrated. This has gradually grown. So we actually, you can look at the history of even the 20th century and you can see how maybe advertisements started to sell the non-castrated other. Right? These, these people in these adverts or these TV programs who seem to have these idyllic lives. But increasingly within a kind of globalized capitalist world, um, this demand to enjoy is not just on the adverts or in the odd TV show, it's kind of ubiquitous. It's in social media where every other person is kind of presenting a lifestyle, often like a lifestyle of kind of pleasure and enjoyment. Um, and this creates a number of issues. This is a theological thing, right? The God of the demand to enjoy, who is ubiquitous today, one of the things that it does is it creates jealousy and envy among the people who feel they're excluded from that enjoyment, who can't seem to get it. And it creates anxiety among the people who pretend that they do have it, right? pretend to themselves or to other people that they have it. Right? Because if you go with the idea, and next month I'll explore this in more depth, but the idea that we are all cut in some way, that we've all experienced death in order to enter into life, then all of us are either playing a game in which we're pretending that we're really happy, or we're, we're pretending we're really happy to annoy somebody or to evoke their desire, their jealousy or their desire or whatever. Um, you know, so for example, recently I was reading a book in Belfast beside the Ligon, it was a beautiful day, and I took a picture of the book and the Ligon, and I put it up on my Instagram. Like, why, why am I doing, doing that? that? Like, like, I, wasn't I wasn't just getting, getting enjoyment from reading, reading the book. book. I, was I was looking, looking for, for a substitute, substitute enjoyment of other, other people, people thinking that I was having enjoyment. enjoyment. Right. So, right. so, so there's a, that's, the that's the substitute symbolic, symbolic enjoyment. enjoyment. We don't just, we don't just enjoy, enjoy the reading. reading. We now we also, also enjoy knowing, knowing that we're reading. And what was more interesting potentially was getting the enjoyment of people looking at what I was doing and going, oh, that looks really lovely, right? Nothing right or wrong about that necessarily, but it's just an interesting phenomenon that you, you can note that enjoyment isn't private, enjoyment is public, right? Even if you're privately playing a computer game, 
uh, not thinking about anybody else, but you get a very good score, you might want to share that score with other people. You might fantasize about sharing that score with other people. Um, oh yeah, so uh, this demand to enjoy causes within society incivility, fragmentation of social relations, um, anxieties, uh, jealousies and envies. Um, and the conservative, honest intellectual conservative is honest, is usually very aware of the problems that are created by the society of enjoyment, the society of this demand to have jouissance. So you see very, you know, honest and intelligent conservatives often critique the society of pleasure, right? By wanting to reinstitute uh, limits, right? The interesting thing about this is that those limits are still in the service of the demand to enjoy. So a lot of conservatives will say, well, you should have sex within the confines of marriage, but not because sex should be kind of, in a sense, less enjoyable, but because that's the most enjoyable way to have sex, right? So you, you see that, that it gets dressed up as a way to actually have more enjoyment by restricting your enjoyment, which is a very, persuasive message for many people who are in the anxiety of, of, of trying to have pleasure. Having boundaries gives a certain kind of um, uh, enjoyment, right? It gives a certain kind of bind your anxiety to a certain extent. So what happens, which is interesting, is you can't go back to the society of the prohibition. You can't go back to that. We are in the society of the demand to enjoy. And so even whenever someone tries to like the conservative move to, to limit and to go back and to limit enjoyment, always is dressed up in service of the God of the demand to enjoy. And therefore that nostalgic uh, philosophy of them becomes very reactionary. And then you see within the most kind of reactionary forms of conservatism, uh, the mixture of sacrifice and pleasure. Right, real sacrifice, like you need to sacrifice for your country, you need to give up your pleasures in this way and that way and the other way. And yet you see at the rallies this incredible jouissance, this incredible outpouring of, of pleasure in the very attempt to bind the society of enjoyment. Anyway, so this is what I was trying to argue. <laughs> I was arguing then that what happens and what you can predict in America is that um, there will be a return to a very kind of um, there will be a return to boundaries there will be a turn to prohibitions there will be and there'll be very reactionary returns and there'll be even fascistic returns but and this is where Elliot and I disagreed is like that is the result of the society of the demand to enjoy it's not just a reactionary move against it it's dialectically connected with it like it's uh, they're both intertwined so you can't hate one and love the other you have to kind of go oh these are all interconnected and then of course we have to work out what the solution is which i want to talk about in more depth anyway that's me waffling for a bit telling you a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday what's on my mind at the moment what i want to talk about next month and maybe if you've got some questions about that we can talk about that now in fear and trembling, but I'm going to look and see if uh, you have any questions and comments and let's get going. Okay, they're thorn in my side. Yeah, uh, I wonder who the thorn in your side is. Um, this is very good. So and it kind of connects a little bit with what I'm talking about, I think. Um, you say, I wish anger made more sense to me. I feel like I can't relate to the everyday anger that most people and most of the world is more and more experiencing. And I find myself waiting for conversations among friends to resolve some element of anger and I feel helpless or that I'm missing out on bonding, which is a very good point, or just feeling like I can't relate. And all of this just makes me feel, you know, inarticulately angry and lonely. Um, that was beautifully expressed um, that like we live, I mean, one of the things we've seen, and it, like all ages are struggling with particular things, but, but part of what a theorist has to do is understand the present age, understand the antagonisms and the frustrations that exist in the current climate, and that's what you're talking about here. So what are, what's going on today? 
that's creating so much incivility, social unrest, social fragmentation, um, fraying of the social bond. Um, that's a huge thing, which I, we, we could talk all day about. But um, uh, the first thing we have to do is you go, you take seriously the anger. You go, right, there is anger and there is frustration, right? You take absolutely seriously the anger and the frustration in society. But that doesn't mean that what it seems to be about is what it is about. So whenever you're dealing with a neurotic person, say in, in therapy, there might be a real anger that they're feeling in their relationship, but it can be displaced. So it's really an anger at their, the job they hate, right? But they take it out on their partner. They come home, they're angry at their partner, they're frustrated, they get annoyed because of small things. And then they start to feel mad because they're going like, like, yeah, of course, yeah, my partner's right. I'm getting really angry about, you know, something really small. Am I going mad? You go like, no, the anger is real, but that, but it might be displaced anger that's taken from your hatred of your job that you want to shout at your boss, but you can't because at the end you'll get fired. So you take that anger and it goes somewhere else. And the question for me is like, what, what is, where is the, what is the, um, the underlying thing that is generating so much frustration and anger. And I did do a talk on this actually, so maybe I'll point back to that. I forget what the talk was called, but um, I mean, I, I do think that a lot of this is, is economic. Um, it's about economic precarity, underemployment, alienation in the workplace. Uh, there's a lot of genuine suffering that's going on. Uh, but some companies, it, it's, it's in their best interest for us not to kind of see the true reason for the social unrest. And so we get, um, we get easy enemies. We get easy, uh, easy sol solutions to the anger. But anyway, I hear what you're saying. So people are frustrated, people are angry. Um, and we need more people who are able to somehow uh, create, create a space, space where it can happen, happen like, like you're saying. saying. And, and I think, think so many people want that. that. The, the truth is, the world doesn't really look like, like Twitter. <laughs> um, um, all, all of us get angry occasionally, occasionally. All, all of us get frustrated. frustrated. All, all of us have things that like, like make, make us blow up. up. But, but almost all of us, you know, all of us are reasonable when we're given the right environment, when we're respected, when we're listened to. And the, and the, the, the big, big question, question that you're not even answering, answering but the question, the question that you're asking, you're asking is, is, how do we create, create those spaces, spaces where we can, where we can genuine, genuine conversation that is transformative? I'll give you one example, maybe one example of how this can look. Today, we often have debates in which, say I'm debating you, say you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat. I, as a Democrat, point out all the things that you're doing wrong as a Republican. And you as a Republican point all the things that I'm doing wrong as a Democrat. We fight. And the whole point of this is eventually maybe I'll win you over. Or if not you, I'll win over some of the people who are watching this debate, who are neutral or who are on your side, right? Um, but the problem with that is the more you attack somebody, the more defensive they get rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter. It's like, if you attack me for something, I will, my defenses come up and I'll be, and I'll hold off. In, in the evangelism project, which I used to run in Belfast, where we used to go to be evangelized by other people, you kind of are, are, are trying to create a different type of debate where, for example, you're, um, you're the Republican, I'm the Democrat. But, I ask you as a Republican, tell me what I'm not seeing about myself. I want you to, you're not going to convince me to be a Republican necessarily, but you might get me to be a better Democrat because I can't figure out for the life of me why you'd be a Republican, why you wouldn't be on my side. It doesn't make sense to me. I just, I, it doesn't really make sense to me, but I'm going to sit down and I want to listen and I'm going to see myself through your eyes and uh, see, see, what, see what happens, right? And then maybe I'm sitting there and then you're telling me that, my goodness, you know, you gave up a lot of freedom to, to corporate America. You know, you're very blind to a lot of the kind of financial workings of the Democratic Party. You know, you kind of, kind of see now, you like, I thought the Democrats, I thought you were kind of more anti-authoritarian, but I've seen you defend the CIA and, uh, you know, all of that, right? <laughs> you go, oh yeah. And then vice versa, you, say like what am i missing about myself 
I want you as a Democrat to be the eyes through which I see myself better. And then I can kind of start to critique you and go, well, you know, I can see in this kind of like, you know, you seem to have a fear of the enjoyment of the other. You seem to want to police the other, uh, da, 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 whatever it is, right? And the idea of the discussion is not that you become a Democrat or I become a Republican, but that you help me become a better Democrat. I help you become a better Republican. And actually movement forward begins to happen. So concretely, there are things that we can do either in our families or if we are leaders, we can create those kinds of spaces where you literally create the rules and you make it fun and enjoyable. So the evangelism project was a fun experience or, or the last supper where you have an, a guest who talks, who, who would disagree with you. I know most of you know the last supper, but you know, 12 of us would get together, invite someone with a controversial opinion. If we don't like what they say, it's their last supper, hence the last supper. But it's a playful thing over a meal where we listen to a different position, even a controversial position, not to necessarily be convinced by it, but to see if it can open us up to more movement um, and thought within ourselves. So yeah, we need more of that anyway, I'm waffling. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tim, oh yeah, you're gonna ask a technical question. Okay, let's see how we get with this. Um, about Hegel's spirit, and she's ex take on the embodiment of the Holy Spirit restricted to the community of believers. Right. Uh, or does the spirit operate through the human community whether or not they are aware of the death of God? Okay, so that's a, mm. in a nutshell, uh, this question is based on the idea that Christianity uh, can be seen from a Hegelian perspective as a type of, uh, 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 how would you say, in this reading it's almost there's God the Father, the Absolute, enters into the world kind of and, and dies in the world right so there's this kind of father son and holy ghost and the community of this holy spirit for a, for a, someone like shizak is a community of people who don't in a sense love god but who in loving each other experience the love of god right so it's god is not an object that you love but rather a reality that you experience in the act of love itself but, but not, not like a theistic, theistic reality. reality. Something, Something about, about I mean, you can say like, like religion, religion is, an is an orientation to something that you cannot, you cannot touch or feel. feel. It's, it's inherently, inherently a critique of materialism. materialism. But that doesn't, but that doesn't mean, mean that, that what it, what, what it, what it can, can mean is substantive. Right? It, can, right? it can be a lack, there's a lack, there's an antagonism, there's an ongoing asymmetry within the universe. And the community of the Holy Ghost is the group of people who live into that asymmetry, that antagonism, um, uh, and give themselves to it. In other words, never believing in a utopia, never thinking that we can have a substantive answer, but rather we progress is made through the constant antagonism of debate and discussion and movement. Um, and so in, in a nutshell, Tim, for a yes, the, the, the community, community of the Holy Ghost, Ghost is any community, community that lives that, that, that does that, 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 that lives in that antagonism, antagonism um, that, that they're living the death, death of God, God whether they, they call it that or not. Um, um, let's see. Okay, okay, there's, there's a, small a small question. question. <laughs> oh, oh, you know what, you sometimes, know what? sometimes, sometimes people, people are typing, typing points around, around so, so sometimes, sometimes it's hard to hard grab, grab it. But, but let me see. Uh, what did you have for breakfast, breakfast this morning? This morning. Thanks, Thanks, goodness. Do you like black pudding? You know what, I do like black pudding. I only have it very rarely in Belfast. Black pudding, for anyone who knows, is like blood. Blood and wheat or something like that. Very actually tasty, but you have to get over the fact that you're eating blood. They eat it uh, for breakfast in Ireland. Um, what's called an, an Irish breakfast or an Ulster fry. Uh, okay, Nicole. We often talk about the relation between child and mother as a male child and the mother and the eatable nature of the child. Ah, what about the female child? Is it different for women? I mean, that's a good question. Like I would probably say for Freud, no. Like there's no male or female child. There's no, like that's that, it's up until and through the eatable experience the child um, 
you know, as such, doesn't have a gender, has a sex, but not a gender as such. Uh, uh, Jung does, he has the uh, Electra complex, right? Which I don't, you know, I don't buy into ever, but he, he has a more essentialist gender kind of notion. But for Freud, not really. In fact, what happens when the child goes through the Oedipal process is, I think in a nutshell, is it's how the parents treat. Well, it's not really. It's by the, when the child hits the Oedipal stage, the child is mostly at the level of the imaginary. So children are very visual, very visual, and very concrete thinkers, right? Remarkably concrete thinkers. And so there is a point where the child will notice uh, uh, that they're similar to one family member and not to the other, similar to one sex and not the other. And they will ask questions about the penis, basically. Um, whether there's one there and there one isn't there. So at the point where it comes to the eatable thing, the question of gender starts to arise um, and, the, and the how, how that plays out. But pre the eatable stage, um, any Freudians want to disagree with me here, but I would say pre that Freud would just say there's the child, not a male child or a female child. Insofar as sexually, yeah, of course, in terms of sex, but not in terms of gender, um, that kind of for Freud comes later. For Jung, as I say, he's an essentialist, so, so he doesn't. Um, yeah. But, but, oh yeah, but I will say one thing, Nicole, and it, it, which you're asking, say, is it different for women? Is that kind of, okay, well, will we get into, this is a thorny issue, right? Because I think this is very big, everyone's talking about it, is gender and sex. Um, in psychoanalysis, Gender, right? So sex, if you, okay, well, well, sorry, this, there's this cup, right? So that's being, that exists. Then there's animals, like cats and dogs, and then humans. Just to simplify, there's three. There's being, life, and self-conscious life, right? Um, you could say that we know from physics that although this, this cup looks like it's solid and stable, there are all these quantum effects going on within it. So there is um, asymmetry and uh, there is asymmetry and antagonism within being itself. But we don't call that sexuality or gender, but it is going on in the cup. When it comes to an animal, uh, that antagonism and asymmetry, you can talk about in terms of sex, sexual difference. So male and female in terms of biology. So animals, the, the kind of a certain sort of antagonism, a certain sort of asymmetry starts to play out in sex, sexual difference, biological sexual difference. When we come to humans, humans are the cup, right being, so we have quantum dimensions within us, antagonisms. We're also animals, life, so we have biological sex. We're also self-conscious creatures of language, so we have another type of asymmetry within us, another type of antagonism, and that brings us into gender. Mostly, um, what, again, to simplify in psychoanalysis, whenever people talk about male and female, they're generally talking about two types of neurosis, right? Obsessional neurosis and hysterical neurosis. Um, what one, and there's, there's, there's two forms of, and they're non-pathological, right? You know, they both sound kind of like obsessional and hysterical and sound like strong terms, but um, I like the fact they're both strong terms, but that, that, that's generally what you're talking about is, is, is masculinity, it looks like a certain form of neurosis, femininity looks like a certain form of neurosis, and that does not map uh, onto sex in a kind of kind of one-to-one -one way, or there are connections. But then you also have, you know, autism, perversion, psychosis, which are not gendered in the same way. So you have a lot of under, different other signs of gender. So if you're talking about at the eatable stage, the child is kind of in, becoming engendered, I guess, at the eatable stage. They, that's where the child is becoming engendered. And, and um, uh, the two most common ways, but not exclusive, but two of the common ways are two forms of neurosis. And often the male engenders one type of neurosis, the female engenders another type of neurosis. But as I say, they're not the only options. That's, we might want to come back and talk more, because I know that's a very kind of uh, controversial contemporary discussion at the moment, where, you know, what is sex, what is gender? Um, oh yeah, but, oh, I, by the way, I'm loving that this is going back and forth between difficult and easy questions. Someone said, you're liking the beard, botany and beer. Thank you. I was thinking that, 
when you're young, beards make you look older, but when you're older, beards make you look younger, right? So because they hide a multitude of sins, you know, hide a bit of your face. So uh, I thought I've got to that age where uh, I should have a beard. <laughs> oh yes, is this the pubic lecture seminar? Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. For anybody who got the email, I Freudian slipped and said this is the pubic seminar, but that is for, that's only if you're a top giver on Patreon do you get the pubic seminars. Um, you gotta sign up for at least a hundred bucks a month for that. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Nicole says, question, okay, you went there. What's your commentary on the abortion debate? Wow. Yeah, that's the very question I thought, why am I doing and ask me anything at this very point? Um, you know, I'll say a few things like that. One is, of course, I want to kind of, like, I want, I want a space where some sort of conversation can happen, even a heated and angry conversation can happen. Um, and that's ha that is happening to a certain extent. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting because one of the questions, and this is one of the, the big questions for me, is like, the, what is the role of the Supreme Court in America? So I did loads of reading up. I'm not from America, so I didn't know anything about the role of the Supreme Court. So um, when this happened, I was like, okay, like what is, what, what is the Supreme Court supposed to rule on and what is it not? Um, and that's an interesting way. So one question is a question of, for me, is like, what, what's the role of the Supreme Court in America? And, you know, you can be pro-choice and also think the Supreme Court shouldn't, uh, that's not in, that, in its remit, or you can be pro-life and think that it is in its remit. So there's already an interesting complication is um, the role of the Supreme Court, which uh, I don't have, uh, yeah. So anyway, there's that interesting question. Um, and there is a question of whether states, progress with abortion rights kind of stopped with the Supreme Court. Um, and so like, yeah, so there's an interesting question there. Um, I guess, okay, how am I gonna write, this is good. <laughs> how do I answer this question? I mean, the way I see it is that there's very few people who think that abortion is completely wrong. Like very few people, hardly anybody, who doesn't think that abortion isn't at some way legitimate, even if they say it's a necessary evil, some way legitimate under certain circumstances. So that's almost everybody. And almost everybody doesn't think that there are not ethical and moral questions in at least some cases of abortion, like basically abortion up to say time of birth, right? So actually, the first thing I kind of want to say is, is there a sense in which a vast majority of us are kind of on a spectrum? with very few people at either side. And these positions at either side are ones that I think are, you know, I think most of us will agree are unreasonable, right? So now we've got a question, okay, so all of us, almost all of us go like abortion um, is, is acceptable uh, under certain circumstances. And now we have to have the really difficult discussion about what that looks like. Um, and we, you know, we have to respect someone. Like, it's very difficult because in one sense, of course, I'm like, if you are pro-life, then you obviously will not elect to have an abortion except under very extreme circumstances or against your, your ethical position, which we all do occasionally. And if you're pro-choice, you should have the ability to, to act on that. Um, so that's, you know, but... The, yeah, yeah, there, there are, are difficult, difficult questions because, because we live in a society where, um, you know, if someone is pro-life and they believe, say, that, it's, that uh, the unborn are human from conception or whatever, then you can see that they're going like, well, I do want to live in a society in which abortion occurs because we're a society, we're not all individuals. Um, you go, okay, well, that's a, you know, I can understand if you're in that position that's what you would think. And somehow we have to give space for that to be expressed. Um, and at the same time, say that there are so many people who also don't think like that. Um, and, uh, you know, there needs to be, be so how do we kind of have that conversation and also enact laws? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. Um, I, um, what do I think? 
America, America can, can move, move forward. forward. I, don't I don't know. know. I mean, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I do think I do that, think that like, like, you know, you know the, the pro-life. Pro I get these I get terms, these terms like pro-life boys and girls. Not very good fan of them, but I have to think through but, why. But like, pro-life. Um, that position, I think, while being able to be held within certain individuals and even in certain communities. Um, should not be imposed on all of America. Um, and uh, unless, you know, say the majority of Americans, the vast majority of Americans somehow think that, and then, and then in terms of like, a, I guess, maybe I have to rethink my position there. So, okay, I basically said nothing, okay? <laughs> I basically said nothing. If, you, if anyone's got any insights, like, please let me know. Um, Russell Brand attempted to discuss it. And I, I quite like what he said, which was, he said, listen, wherever you stand on this, if, you know, try to see what the other person is saying, what the other person's position is, try to not even for, you know, just, in, just because you share society with them, if for no other reason, then it's like, listen, we all share the society. Somehow, we've got to be able to protest. We've got to be able to legislate. We've got to be able to express our opinions. We've got, got to be allowed to be angry and we've got to be allowed to express all of that. And somehow as well, um, understand that, yes, yeah, some issues are deeply, deeply emotive. And, find a way to kind of like uh, acknowledge that. Okay, so I think I've said nothing for five minutes there. I apologize. Please come in and tell me what you think and uh, what you think uh, a better approach would be. <laughs> um, Greg asks, what is the relationship between psychoanalysis and democracy? They seem to complement, but at the same time, the nature of desire makes me wonder. Uh, just a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Greg. Psychoanalysis and democracy, and this also connects in with the last question, is um, it, it, one of the problems with democracy, which is the bit like, as, as um, Winston Churchill said, you know, it's a bad system until you compare it to all the others, <laughs> it's least bad, but is that we often vote against our own self-interests, we often vote against our own desires, we often, um, like, it, like it used to be this idea that if we educate people, people will, you know, vote the right way or vote in their own interests or vote kind of, but it, we're not like that. Human beings are very, uh, we've got death drive. And so um, psychoanalysis is often a space in which you try to come to see your darker desires and the darker conflicts that, that animate you. Um, and in doing that, you know, hopefully become a more, uh, thoughtful and less self-destructive individual or a, a, a person who's less destructive to others and to yourself um, uh, and hopefully to become more free and then to be hopefully a better subject, a better citizen, a, better, a person who is more able to enter into healthy political dialogue. But yeah, I, I, uh, that's a very good question. Psychoanalysis and democracy. Um, uh, you could maybe want to argue that psychoanalytic theory and paratheology are attempting to help us be better subjects who are more kind of better engaged in democracy or more critical of it. I'm very critical of current democracy, by the way, um, I, because I think I don't think most of the time you're not voting for anything different. Like I hate to say it, it's not very popular in America, but often, but. It hasn't been the case more recently, but mostly you're you're just voting between two neoliberal parties, right? That's what you're you're choosing between two flavors of neoliberalism. Um, you're not. Whereas the last election, you were choosing between really socialism and nationalism, which are both critical of neoliberalism. So there was a stage in America where, with Bernie Sanders um, and Trump, you had two critiques of neoliberalism. Um, or, you know, partial critiques of neoliberalism. And that was kind of really interesting for me what was going on in America. And suddenly I was like, oh, democracy, this is, this suddenly, the stakes are more interesting here. But then the Democratic Party very much wiped out 
the kind of more socialist dimension to, of themselves. Um, and then, yeah, the nationalist dimension of the Republicans. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it, that's, that's now thriving kind of outside of the, maybe the, the, the Republican Party. But, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that became, became interesting, interesting but most of the time, uh, what, 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 what uh, democracy, democracy is in America at the moment is, is I say, to to voting for new liberalism, and I can't bring myself to vote for new liberalism. Because I don't like it. I mean, I think even what you're seeing in Ukraine at the moment is a direct connection to uh, NATO, NATO and, and neoliberalism, and, 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 and you, know, you, you have, have to understand, understand that, that, to understand, understand Russia's motivation in attacking Ukraine. Ukraine. Anyway, anyway um, um, cash, cash or card, 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 my goodness. My goodness. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay. okay. I'll come back to me and all these. You asked me controversial things. We touched on abortion, we touched on the Ukraine war there, touched on democracy and neoliberalism. Um, oh, yeah, what are my thoughts on cryptocurrency? Uh, from a psychological perspective. I, I actually got into cryptocurrency a few years ago, mostly just as a way to protect some savings, um, ironically, because uh, cryptocurrency is wiped out now, pretty, pretty much. much. But um, I do, I'm not a big believer. Like, I'm very, I'm very, um, you know, there's a lot of new technologies that are not new. Like whenever Uber came out, for example, it was like, oh, this is a new kind of ride sharing service that's going to transform the you know transport and it kind of did but it did not necessarily now it used new technology but it 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 did something new by cutting away regulation so basically taxi services used to be like uber and a bit of a wild wild west and then there was more protection of the workers and protect you know so there's greater protections greater regulations and then a company comes in and basically finds a way around all of those regulations, makes a lot of money, but eventually starts to get regulated. Yeah, you start to have start to protect your workers. You start to have to give them rights. Start to have to give them, you know, sick pay, healthcare, whatever. Um, so sometimes what seems like a new technology from Silicon Valley is really just a way to get around uh, regulations. Some regulations that might be. Um, bad, right? That, that might be impeding growth, but some regulations that are there to protect workers um, that are legitimate. So sometimes I, I kind of see cryptocurrency as kind of like um, the type of wild, wild west again, that will eventually get regulated and, you know, be brought into the fold. And I'm not sure if it's as revolutionary as people think, but anyway, that's just a few thoughts. I've always been a bit skeptical of NFTs as well. I think there's, there's a real, real world use for NFTs. But I sometimes worry that NFTs are a way for people with cryptocurrency to have something to buy because you have to have something to buy. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, is there an echo? Oh no, don't know why that is. Sorry if there is. Oh, Nathan says, how would you describe your work to someone who's unfamiliar with it? Um, Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. I, every now and again, I try to do that, do a little course or a little talk that that tries to do an intro because I realize I've been doing this for so long that if you enter my work now, um, it can be very uh, off-putting. Um, whereas if you entered it at the beginning, it was quite easy because I was embraced. It was about doubt, complexity, ambiguity. I'll tell you where I start with somebody. Often, where I start. And even I do this online, if you notice I'm doing these 60 second parables. Um, there, I try to begin by helping people feel comfortable with doubt, ambiguity and complexity with kind of a certain kind of questioning. Now that's not where it ends at all, but that's kind of often where I begin. And uh, sometimes my, or my first book was introducing, kind of trying try to introduce into evangelicalism an embrace of mysticism, an embrace of this notion of, of a type of uh, passionate unknowing, a learned unknowing, a type of unknowing that comes from deep insight and reflection and passion. Uh, and then from there, it kind of goes deeper. And it, but if I was to kind of put it in a nutshell for somebody, I'm, I'll, I'll, if you were there at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned about there's the God of, the, of, of prohibition. Right. Whereas we're all we're all um, we're all 
uh, divided subjects. We're all have, we're all ambivalent. We love things that we hate. We hate things that we love. We want to go out, we want to stay in, we want to be single, we want to be going out with somebody, we want, we want to live, we want to die. Um, you know, the, the, we are divided, right? And we can be undivided, all right? This division, the, the, the affect is anxiety. The affect of not knowing what we should be or who we are and this, you know, we feel anxiety. And we fantasize, say, God, the traditional religious God, as the one who is outside of these antagonisms. Then you have the God of the demand to enjoy, which is today the, the promise that we can actually be undivided. You can have what you want and you can be, you can get rid of these anxieties through drugs or meditation or money. So commodity satisfaction, psychedelic enlightenment, sexual liberation, whatever it is, these ersatz gods that promise to get rid of the anxiety. Parotheology is a way of saying, no, you are divided. You, you are asymmetrical. And that dividedness is actually woven into everything, including the absolute itself. So there is no exception to this struggle that we are. And actually being able to somehow say yes to that, to embrace that, um, is what will help us lead a more fulfilling, deeper experience of life, a depth and a density to life. And that's what paratheology is. Paratheology really in a nutshell is the idea that even the absolute is divided, which is called Trinity. And, you know, there is, a, there is a type of division within the one. The one is not two, the one is not one. So the one is also other and the split. So the one is three, yeah. Okay, there's an echo. I am sorry, I don't know what to do about that. Um, I'm not sure why it's happening. So we'll just keep going and hopefully it's not too bad. Echo, 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 everyone's saying it. Right, what are we gonna do about this? Oh, we can turn that off. And... Oh, oh here, you know what? I'll, I'll try, try one thing, see if, if I can, can fix, fix this. this. Uh, I bet you that's fixed. Oh dear, I bet you that fixed it. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, I, yeah, there was basically, it was recording on my iPhone as well, so hopefully it's working out. Uh, um, oh yeah, Mary, um, uh, Mary Beth, sorry, Mary Beth is asking me uh, about, more about the self-divided God, like to give a kind of definition, impact to religion and spirituality. Yeah, I mean, I would say that you have traditionally, the notion either of God as whole and complete. That's for me the more basic definition of God. God lacks lack. I think confessional Christianity has that. That's generally you find that notion within most forms of spirituality, including Gnostic and New Age spirituality. It's this God of the one. Then you have, you can have multiplicity, which is kind of the notion of the universe is infinitely singular, like every thing is relating to everything else, but as a sing as a singular other, right? So that, so you know, it's like atomized. The, the universe is a, a multiplicity of, of, of difference, right? And then you have kind of dialectic. Um, you also have dualism. Sorry, du so you got monism, you got dualism, you got multiplicity. Here's probably your three kind of basic metaphysics. The universe is one. The universe is two. Uh, which uh, two basically is that there's light and dark, there's chaos and order, there's masculine and feminine, there's these, these kind of two parts that then can blend together in a kind of like whole, but it's different from monism. Monism is there is not, there is no two, there is only one. Um, dualism and then multiplicity. And uh, what I'm arguing for, and you see all, you can build religions of all of, all of those. Um, Paratheology is the, the religion of dialectic, which is not the one or the two or the many, uh, but the not one. <laughs> that God is not one with God's self. In other words, there's a quantum dimension to the absolute. Uh, and a quantum dimension means that there is an antagonism or asymmetry at the very heart of reality that is reflected in this coffee cup 
reflected in life, reflected in self-conscious life and reflected in reason. And we as a human being, we have the quantum uh, asymmetry going on in our bodies. Biology, evolution, so evolution is going on within us in some sort of very minor way. There's a kind of antagonism that, that is within us as an organism. And then also as sub subjective beings, there is an asymmetry within our mind, which is called the unconscious. And parotheology is saying that this asymmetry is uh, is the very nature, is the universal, is what is what is in reality. And the the name for this in Christianity is the crucified Christ, right? God who dies, the infinite who's finite, that which cannot die, dying, right? This this uh, you know what Kierkegaard would say: the the, the bringing together of contradiction is uh, is, is Christ crucified, um, and uh, yeah, so that. And I don't think we've kind of like, you know, I think we need to get, and, and parotheology so is the technology of that insight. It develops, it's developing communi communities or spaces in which we can live into that and feel free within that anxiety. Yeah. Um. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, Morningstar says, what's wrong with Jesus? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but it's a good question because I feel like I have uh, not really looked much at Jesus in my last lot of years of work. Richard Boothby at Wake did this beautiful talk on these ideas and their relationship with Jesus. And um, I'm going to be putting that talk up uh, very soon on my YouTube channel. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, it's a beautiful talk on the There is a novelty, mystery, complexity woven into reality. So I'm excited about the book. I just um, have been very bad at writing it. I apologize. Um, oh yeah, people are asking me about wanting me to have an OnlyFans now. Yeah, maybe. I might be driven to it. Who knows? <laughs> um, <laughs> you say you're castrated, but I think we want proof. OnlyFans now. <laughs> um, Let's see. This is all very good. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for engaging with me, everybody. Um, question. Liz, I think the shared loss is something that people do want to admit. We try to separate ourselves from this shared experience through capitalism, etc. Yep. Except then we punish poor people for having iPhones. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the shared loss is something that people do want to admit. 100%. We try to separate ourselves from the shared experience through capitalism, through having, yeah. Um, except we punish people for having, yeah. Like, if I, if I was to describe what a, a community, and I, I, want, I like the word commune, or communion, sorry, communion, because communion is a group who gather around a shared loss. A community are gathered together around a shared set of beliefs, a shared set of practices, something that we all, something positive that we all share in common. A communion, is a group gathered together around a shared loss, the death of God, right? Um, so for me, the church in its radical sense can be a communion in which we are gathered together around a shared loss, where we acknowledge the shared loss, the trauma that is being human. And in doing that, we break the back of this frenetic pursuit of running from that insight, which is exactly what you're talking about, where we run from that insight when we run from the insight, we start to believe that having enough money, having enough this, having enough that will make us fixed. We, we enter into this frenetic pursuit that causes all sorts of problems. When you realize that your shared connection with the humanity of the other, who is also uh, 
marked by loss, you, I think, create a community of empathy, a community that where that will be a benefit to wider society. So anyway, those I like, kind of like communion is a nice example of that, but absolutely totally agree with you. Um, I don't know what OBS is. Peter, are you using OBS? Not sure what that is. Um, da, da, da. Oh yeah, uh, Lou, Lou says, could, could this be an example? Uh, why in hard Germany, decadent sex, fascist reaction, yes. Yeah, Nazi enforced sacrifice. Absolutely, what, what I wanna say, about, I, because these words are thrown about so easily in, in the contemporary discourse, I wanna be careful, but basically yes, decadent demand to enjoy will always result in a fascist response. Um, but and you could almost define fascism as the enjoyment of prohibition itself, the enjoyment of sacrifice itself, where sacrifice is wrapped up in a type of excessive pleasure. Um, you even see it within Nazi uniforms, which are kind of fetishistic in nature. You know, there's a very sexual dimension to them, you know, um, and you see it in certain movements today in America. And my, uh, yeah, kind of position on this is that it's not that this is just some sort of like, reactionary cancer that can be cut out. It's like, no, it's the exact, always the response to decadence. It's always the response, precisely because decadence breeds so much anxiety and jealousy and envy and anxiety. So it, it, it creates a lot of jealousy and envy because if you're not enjoying, you look at all these people who are enjoying, like the fundamentalist preacher who's screaming about the gay community and like and, and talking about how they're having sex all the time and like you can tell they're just really jealous because they're imagining this community that are just having so much sex right and they hate them for it right um so there's this fantasy the other is having all of this enjoyment and there's jealousies and envies or if you're in a community where you're supposedly having lots of sex and drugs and enjoyment that just generates so much um anxiety and uh and you know lack of boundaries that often those people will will be very susceptible to a religious leader who comes in and puts barriers on you see this all the time with people who used to be like crazy drink and drugs and partying and then become very conservative uh it happened with obviously the acid heads in the 60s who all became jesus freaks in the 70s whatever you know in the west coast um all these people who were dropping acid and then then went back to very conservative religious expressions, including like Jim Jones, you know, came out of all of that. And um, so, yeah, I think basically this is where you don't have to be. It's like, it's so easy. You don't have to be, have a crystal ball. You go, the God of the demand to enjoy will create the God of renunciation and the pleasure of renunciation. And they're dialectically interconnected. Um, and the only way out of it, I think, is when we realize that we're all divided, right? So it's not some, uh, we're, we're, we're all divided, but some people are having all the fun. It's not that, hey, we can all have the fun. It's, hold on a second, there's a certain sense in which we're all divided, and that's where we unify, and that's where we connect. And can we create a society in which we realize that there is a sacrifice to being human? We can acknowledge that, and we can share that. Um, you know, and we can get into the insights. So like my, my issue with contemporary society is sacrifice is vital. Sacrifice is equivalent to meaning, right? That's an argument I'd make that without sacrifice, there's no meaning. If you get rid of sacrifice, you will get rid of meaning. Whether it's gift giving, giving someone a gift is a sacrifice, whatever. You need to have non-economic exchanges, right? Which means, you know, you're sacrificing, you're struggling, and meaning happens. The problem is in our society, some people sacrifice everything. They're having to do all of the sacrifice and then some people have to sacrifice very little, right? And the people who have to sacrifice everything are destroyed, devastated, alienated, like completely driven to death. And then, but then if you're lucky enough to not be the one that has to sacrifice, then you become melancholic and you suffer from all sorts of weird 
kind of psychological illnesses. That, so the losers lose doubly, but even the winners lose. <laughs> what can we imagine a society where we all sacrifice for society and we all have the benefits of the sacrifice of the society, right? So we all sacrifice, we all get the benefits, um, and it's just a very different way of thinking about things. But it's not a society without sacrifice. This is my critique of some very naive forms of luxury communism is like it's almost like a, a fantasy of a world without sacrifice no like sacrifice is what makes life really interesting and wonderful what's terrible is a sacrifice where these people have to sacrifice everything and they don't get the benefits of that sacrifice and these people don't sacrifice anything and they get the benefits of the sacrifice but then they get they they suffer melancholy because um life lacks significance uh yeah <laughs> yeah i feel like pizza hegelian agony aunt that's very good not much money in that unfortunately but that's yeah that would be a hegelian agony aunt that's good um all right i've been talking for ages so i should probably let you go let me see um but let me jump in a couple oh yeah stephanie this is interesting stephanie ramirez um uh, if you think without a capitalist framework, you never lose anything because you never leave really a step to question mark. Yeah. Universal lag is too ambiguous for me. That's interesting. Universal lag. Yeah, if you think without a capitalist framework, you never lose anything because you never really possessed it. Uh, I think there's something interesting in what you're saying there, but uh, I'd need to hear more. But um, it's interesting. Universal lag is too ambiguous for me. I, I kind of think I see what you're saying. Universal lack is too ambiguous. You want to be. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely, would, if I was sitting down chatting with you, I'd want you to kind of like talk to me more about that because it does get to the key. Is For me, there's two types of therapy or psychoanalysis. There's, there's For me, psychoanalysis in the Freudian, Lacanian sense, which is where the object is a lost object. There is a, an actual very concrete lack, but it is abstract. There's a lack there that, 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 that marks everybody. And then there are certain forms of thinking that don't start with that. I think kind of, you know, object relations, Jungian thought, whatever, does not start with this idea of a universal lack, but, and Deleuze, whatever. But um, I don't, I, I don't, I can't, I cannot see how, theoretically speaking, and more, you can't start without a lack. I've got, no, I still can't see it, but yeah, um, maybe I will. Uh, let's see. This is very good. Okay. Um, Stephanie, actually, you've been saying a few points. I think you're having a conversation, actually, so it might be hard for me to jump in, but it looks like an interesting conversation. Say, so language is a form of communication. Birds communicate. Birds don't appear to. Exist. Ah, oh, well, this is interesting. Language is a form of communication. Birds communicate. Birds don't appear to exhibit universal loss or loss at all. Yes, but I would want to make a distinction between language and communication is that um, what Lacan says about language and the difference between the two is communication, you're exactly right. In communication, there is no loss. So in the animal kingdom, a certain sound means something mating or danger or food, right? And there's a there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, like there can be mistakes, but there's no interpretation as such. There is, a, it's basically a sign, not a signifier. Communication is signs, language is signification. Um, interestingly, kind of in autism, you have something interesting going on there, but we'll, um, anyway, I'll come back to that maybe. But signs are the thing means that. Uh, but language, comes into being when something drops out. And that's what I would argue is that, and I think this is where I'm kind of agreeing with you negatively as and I agree with you, but I'm saying about communication, there's, there's no loss in communication as such. Uh, it's like computer language is communication, but language is where something, something never hits the thing. But that would be it, it's like, like the, the, Hegel says the birth of the world is the death of the world, which means that as soon as language comes into being, you never quite hit it. So for example, you can never just buy a pair of jeans, right? I can never just go into a shop and go, I just wanna buy a no nonsense pair of jeans. Or I don't want a hipster coffee, all this hipster coffee. I just want black coffee served in a cafe. Like basically don't give me all of this stupid 
hipster shit, right? But the problem is, you are the type of person and symbolically who doesn't like hipster stuff you you're down to earth you like just black coffee in a cafe or give me some regular jeans and not some sort of fancy stuff in other words you never you can never just engage with the world there's 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 always more going on symbolic exchange there's always this this movement and the movement results from and comes from the fact that you never hit the thing. A dictionary is just words, de defining other words, you never hit the thing. So for me, there's something very significant about moving from communication to language. Now, of course you don't move completely out of it. There is communication within language, but language is a form of, is a form of discourse that is different from where something precisely has dropped out. So I think your insight is correct that birds communicate but I don't think human, what human beings are doing is it's not just more complicated, it's a fundamentally different mode of communication um, in, which, in which basically, I mean, Lacan says it very well where he says, right, there are animals that you can track because they leave, they leave, they leave a trail. And then there are animals that hide their tracks, right? So you can get some animals that like, they, they know how to, in a very superficial way, try to hide their tracks. But then Lacan says, but there's only one type of animal we know that can leave real tracks um, uh, with the intention of them being read as fake. Right? So there's someone leaves real tracks, there's an animal who leaves fake tracks, that, that whatever, and then there's us, we can leave real tracks because we are interpreting that the hunter will think, well, they would never leave real tracks because they know I'm hunting them, so they're probably fake tracks. And basically what Lacan is saying is at that point you're in language, at the point where you can say the truth and tell a lie or a lie and tell the truth, you know, I love you when I hate you, I want you to leave whenever you really want the person to fight to stay. When you're in that space of um, where there's something that's dropped out and of, uh, that's where you're in language. Anyway. Uh, but lots of interesting questions going on here. Uh, Oh, um, okay, you know what? That's, I've been chatting for ages and now there's just an interesting conversation going. So I will kind of finish up. And what will I say is, um, I don't know how you experienced that. It was very fun for me. We touched on a few difficult things where, but I, you know, the very first question from Thorn, Thorn on my side was a question of how do we have difficult conversations and how do we, you know, with, without, um, and how do we interpret anger and how do we, I suppose, allow all of that to happen and yet not destroy us? How do we create solidarity or some sort of productive conversations in the midst of what I think we all feel, which are times of incredible difficulty, where, there's, where there is often a desire to uh, have moral superiority of, of, of one group over another. See, our basically purity culture. We live in a purity culture where there's the clean and the unclean, the inside, the outside. Uh, how do we create space for movement? And it's very, very difficult. I think, uh, you know, we, we talked about abortion briefly there and I waffled a little bit. Um, I guess because what I would love to see is it's not that, it's not that I'm arguing for like some some kind of tolerance of everybody we all get together and we all kind of like agree to disagree it's no it's like more like like novelty cannot arise without real conflict uh, in northern ireland i went through the 30-year war i was born in 1973 um, and all my life i was in a conflict that ended in 1998 and it was a conflict in which it only came to an end when these parties who were diametrically opposed were kind of forced together to talk, to negotiate. Now, before that, each side knew what was right and knew the other side was bad, and each side had their justifications and their ideology. But things got so bad that they forced each other, everyone was forced into a room, and it was an apocalyptic meeting, i.e. nobody knew what the result would be. It was only the case that novelty and possibility could only arise through genuine conflict, um, not war. 
you know, conflict is where war is turned into a back and forth. War is you want to kill the other. Conflict is where you wrestle. And we created a police force. Um, it was a very radical document um, that created one of the most successful peace processes in the modern world. Probably the most successful peace process in the modern world is Northern Ireland. Um, and so it's not like morally even, you can go like morally we should listen to each other or whatever, but it's more like, it's more philosophically, like we are neighbors, right? We are, we share social space. And unless we think we can literally kill everybody who we fundamentally disagree with, uh, we're going to have to enter into a conflict. But if we enter into a really interesting conflict, that is where we're able to back and forth and listen to the other, one thing can happen is novelty can arise, new solutions to problems can arise. And okay, and this is where my answer to the abortion thing might be going. The reason why I'm waffling around it is partly because the answer we don't know yet, maybe. Like, Hegel's whole thing is every time you try to imagine what the future looks like, you just imagine an idealized version of your current ideals, right? So for example, people dream about being rich which is just the kind of the idealization of their values. Like, oh, if I was rich, then everything would be okay, right? Um, so our dreams are idealized forms of our present visions and our present, they're just idealized versions of our values, right? Um, the challenge is to dream new dreams, to, to, to kind of almost go, okay, you can't imagine the future, because the future's always, just like sci-fi, right? Every sci-fi movie is not really about the future. It's a, it's a kind of like vision of the present put into some sort of like, you know, idealized or, or kind of like a, um, sometimes dystopian way. But basically all sci-fi movies are really about the present. In the same way, all your visions of utopia tell me not about the future, but they tell me about your present ideals and values. When, for Hegel, all you can do as a political activist is bring up the contradictions that are in the society, show them for what they are, create a space in which they bubble to the surface and they're there and they work and interact and where this kind of conflict happens. And then the future begins to arrive. The future comes. You don't know what it's going to look like. You, all you can do is create the conditions for the future to arise. Just like if two people in a couple go to a couple's therapist, they don't know whether they're gonna to stay together or whether they're gonna separate. What, they, what the therapist does is bring all of the antagonisms onto the surface. And the only thing that is guaranteed is the relationship will not continue in its d dangerous and repressed form, right? The only, they may stay together, they may break up, but if they stay together, they're gonna to break up with the type of relationship they had, or if they part, they'll do something else, but they cannot stay the same. So in a similar way, when we're in these trying situations, it's like, how do we, how do we, and how do, I was reading in Hegel's lectures on religion. He says, basically, there's two ways in which contradiction can happen. Contradiction can, can become violent. So you create opposition, right? And there's two sides fighting, or contradiction becomes productive and it generates something new. So in present times, you go like, we've got these contradictions. They'll either become oppositional and then violent and destructive, or these contradictions will uh, uh, stay connected, intertwined dialectically, and will and we'll create something new. And that's the challenge that we have to face, is creating those spaces, allowing the contradictions to come to the surface, and being very wary of thinking that we have the easy answers to kind of what it looks like. Anyway, there's some final thoughts. Um, really appreciate you being involved, and uh, I will uh, talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.